then make um, talk about AWS services, give us a quick overview of what AWS can do in this field and how they're actually making a, um, AI easier for the likes of SMG to use. And finally, Brett will get uh, into a little bit more technical detail, talking about our journey at SMG into machine learning and a few of the pitfalls we've found along the way. So firstly, who are SMG Studio? What's risk? And why are we talking about AI and ML? I'm sure you've been to plenty of presentations in the past which have uh, had you know, cloudy providers like AWS or certain other companies uh, showing the great stuff they can do or other large companies, consultants, hobbyists and so on, presenting uh, some pretty impressive solutions. So the first question you'll be asking is, who is SMG and why are we talking to, to you about this subject? You've never heard of us before. Well, actually, we have absolutely nothing to do with AI. We are, in fact, a relatively small game studio based in Sydney in Australia. Our history started about 20 years ago as a company called Soap Creative. We're a digital advertising agency, but we've always been focused on creativity and games. We use games to help companies sell their products, originally written in Flash, then Unity, sorry, HTML, then some rather shaky mobile technologies, and we're now almost exclusively a Unity house. In 2013, the name SMG appeared. We formed from staff within Soap Creative specifically to concentrate on our own games. And then four years ago, SMG split from Soap Creative. We now have about 40 staff worldwide, mostly based in Sydney, but also Brisbane, Melbourne, Los Angeles, even Greece, and one now just joined us in Belgium. So as for what we've been up to for the past nine years, a quick look at our portfolio, you'll see we've, we've created quite a few games. We've created games for console. Uh, the most popular two are something called Moving Out and Death Squared. And we've created quite a few mobile games, uh, such as Thumb Drift, Sping, and a series of games called The One More, One More Line, One More Bounce, One More Jump, uh, quite popular little uh, addictive games. We've also done some custom mobile apps. Star Wars Force Link comes to mind, uh, which was a, a proprietary piece of work using Bluetooth technology to help drive Star Wars toys. In total, we've had well over 60 million downloads. We have a social network of around 350,000 people. So we're actually very proud of the work we've done for such a small team. But the game we're going to talk to you today is Risk. Risk is a classic board game. It's now published by Hasbro, and Hasbro also published Monopoly, Scrabble, Clue, to name but a few. For those that don't know Risk, it was created in 1957, and it's a game, board game, where you place troops on a map and you, around the world and you fight battles to win territories. Random dice rolls determine the battle outcomes, but it is actually a game of uh, strategy and cunning. We based our original mobile version off the, off the original board game. It is the officially licensed version from, uh, from Hasbro. It's released on mobile and PC. We've made several improvements since we uh, launched it. For example, we now add 80 maps. We don't have to produce a new board every time we produce a new map. We just add it to the app. We now have fantasy and space themes. We've incorporated rule tweaks from the many board games that have been released. And we've even added some of our own. For example, we've added a zombie mode where you can actually get wiped off the face of the earth by zombie outbreaks. And so far since we released the game, we've had five and a half billion zombies killed worldwide. Not a bad effort. Our monthly active users has peaked at about five million and numbers are still tracking steadily around six years after release. The RISC team is actually only about 10 people, including the producers, the front end developers, the artists, the back end developers, and the server support, customer support, and QA. There's only actually two of us, myself and Brett, who are here today, working on the back end and data services. We also handle all the other data and services stuff for SMG, but fortunately, not too much. Uh, so we concentrate most of our time on RISC but we do have to handle all the server logic, web servers, configuration upgrades, databases, DevOps, and so on. This leaves little time for research, especially for more advanced topics such as ML. 
Something else apart from time that we struggle with is that Risk doesn't make a huge amount of money compared to other mobile games that we see. For example, we're not a pay to win game and never a pay to win game, nor will we ever be. There are no ads in the middle of while you're actually playing a game and games can last three hours, four hours, sometimes even longer. And we do limit the number of games you can play through a token system, but you can still play many hours a day without actually ever needing to watch an ad. So why are we talking with you today? Presenting about AI. We just want to share with you the journey we have taken given the restrictions about the time we have and the finance into how we've used machine learning. We can't justify the cost of consultants, but we are blessed to have AWS to work with us on this journey. And they have loads of tools to explain, to, to explain the issues as we'll go through later. When you start looking at AI and ML, one of the issues we struggled with an awful lot was that there is an, a lot of information on a very technical level, lots of tools. It's a barrage of information and we need help cutting through these complexities. We would love as a small company to see more relevant questions and answers in blog posts or on Stack Overflow, for example, sh you know, sh sharing with us and helping us to resolve the everyday problems and answers. So hopefully throughout this talk, we can inspire you a little bit if you're all in our situation to work with machine learning and, and give it a crack. So I'll now explain what our problem is, the problems we face with risk and how we come to believe that machine learning is the right solution for us. I asked our customer service uh, team to give us the top 10 complaints that we receive or help, help desk tickets we receive for risk. The top three are the fact that we actually try and make any money at all. People complaining about ads or tokens or the fact you have to watch an ad to token. Well, we do sell a premium version. It costs $12, nearly always discounted. We aren't going to change that policy. So essentially there's not, nothing too much we can do to resolve those issues. In position five are dice. As you know, dice are random. The probability of rolling six, uh, 10 sixes in a row is around 604 million to one. Yet we have calculated we roll over 736 million times per day currently. And that doesn't include offline games, incomplete games, some games we never even hear about. With that many rolls, you will get 10 sixes in a row. And of course, people are going to complain when it goes against them. We've put the code on GitHub. We've had even presentations and conferences about this topic. It is a huge topic, uh, but yet we still receive a lot of complaints, but no, nothing much more we can do. Position seven is our ranking system. It benefits some people, other people don't like it. So yes, we will get some complaints. We are looking to improve that system in consultation with the community, but it can't be solved on a technical basis. The bottom three are what we'd call regular support issues. Can you do this in game? Can you please add this? I've lost my password. I've lost my data and so on and so on. That's, that's the kind of support messages we would expect. But that leaves two spots. In position four are cheaters, people complaining that someone cheats. And position five are disconnections. Disconnections, yes, we're looking at solving that with technology, but today we'll just talk on the, uh, the top issue that we can solve with technology, which is cheaters. So what is a cheat? The problem that we face in risk is that every telltale sign of a cheat is also the, the telltale sign of someone playing legitimately. The simplest thing to spot are hackers. Some people are, you know, may add troops to a territory. They may roll too many sixes way beyond any statistical odds. We can catch those relatively easy. But we also need to be aware that software can glitch. A one-off issue, issue, such as too many troops added, may be a bug in the software. Slightly harder to catch are what we call alt accounts. An alt account is where a person will add a second account themselves in a different name. Sometimes they use legitimately. For example, a user wants to do a speed run up the, data, up the leaderboard or, or play in a competition as a new player. Other times, they're definitely not allowed. For example, where a player creates an alt account, play with himself to boost his main account up the leaderboard. But to make this especially tricky in Risk is that Risk has the legitimate notion of something called alliances, where two players agree to work together in a game. 
the idea being they break that alliance, they then can go and defeat the other player to win the game. So it's a battle in the end. Colluding, where two players are communicating outside the game to do exactly the same, or maybe agreeing, you win this time, I'll win the next one, we'll help each other. That's actually outside the rules and distinctly unfair. And one person playing two accounts to, to boost themselves is, again, totally unfair. Spotting the difference is very tricky. We do, of course, have some systems in place to try and track these behaviours, but tolerances have to be wide. To give you an idea of the scale of the problem, we get about 4,000 to 5,000 reports per day that a user has cheated. Most of these are simply because a player lost, or they feel the dice was against them, or the opponent played too quickly. All of these are manually submitted, so there is some basis behind them, but we need to filter out the genuine ones. We also have our automated reports from the systems I've mentioned previously. But to make things complicated, we can't store device IDs on our, for, for the app. So if a user wipes their data and comes back, we can't rely on a device ID to know that they are creating alt accounts or cheating. We are kids safe and copper certified and we do follow all the rules. And also trying to track using IPs is tricky. Uh, VPN is a legitimate use. We do have quite a lot of players that play at work. They do want their VPN so they can sneak a game or two in. Um, so we can't rely on IPs, otherwise we'll be blocking quite a few genuine players. And our semi-automated results give additional headaches. Uh, we run reports against our primary database, which is a big no-no, especially when the database is huge and it takes a long time to run. And also dealing with all these reports takes our customer support team around half a day every day. And remember, we are a team of only 10 people. So losing a staff member for half a day is a huge imposition. So what do we do to try and track, track cheats? We can look at their user behavior. In other words, how long before they, between the time when they register and when they play their first game, do they have a repeating pattern of opponents or game styles, or do they play with particular moves all the time? We look for repeated rule breaking. We could also improve our opponent tracking. For example, we could graph our opponents to see who plays with who the most and are there patterns there, add more variables and statistics to the graph database. We can also track how users select and reject AI opponents. We have a third option, which is to analyze the outcomes. In other words, to look at the results of the game, where a user finished uh, compared to their opponents. Where were they when they abandoned games? Uh, what, how long did it take them to reach their outcome? How many moves and so on? We do all of this already. It's all hard coded on the server, but it ain't good enough. They need constant tweaking and each of these has a different logic. And to us, that just smells like a perfect solution for machine learning. But before we dive into the machine learning or you dive into machine learning, we would point out there are some third party solutions that exist already and you should investigate these. For example, log ingestion and analysis tools. AWS has something themselves called CloudWatch Insights. Unfortunately, that proved no good for the complexities of what we needed. And we've also uh, investigated using some very well-known third-party log analysis and ingestion tools. However, the costs of the ingestion alone were astronomical when we collect you know, a few hundred gig of data per day. To make it slightly palatable, we'd have to strip out and clean our data. By that time, we're 50% of the way down our machine learning journey anyway. There are some companies that do user reputations based on IP or um, asset, sorry, device IDs. It is useful, but not so much for gaming mobile games because all the mobile games have the same device agent. We also checked out the cost of using one system and it was 150% of our entire AWS monthly cost. Something we can't justify, especially if there's a probability of us being able to do it ourselves. Thirdly, there are anti-hack tools. These are uh, tools that we'll try and analyze for hacking in game. We have implemented some limited solutions, not found them totally reliable. So it, it does add to our uh, information that we can use. After all, though, anything can be hacked, including the anti-hack tools. If you are researching this, I'd be tempted to look out Epic Games online services. They have quite a few free tools, including an anti-hack tool. However, they only support PC 
Um, we are also PC and mobile, so it wouldn't work for us. But something else we have found is that by going alone, you learn a lot. We actually enjoy diving into AWS technologies, and there's nearly always a solution or two or three for what we've wanted to do. So we thought, why not give it a crack and avoid trying to do it, uh, uh, try to use other, others' expensive tools and give it and see what AWS can do for us. So having said that, I will actually hand you over to AWS. I will give you uh, Sebastian, he'll give you a brief overview of the AI ML landscape in AWS and how they've been contributing to the field. Awesome. Thanks, Rob. Can I just confirm you can hear me well? Yeah. Yeah, awesome. Uh, hi, all. What I will do just now is I will take you through a very brief view of the AIML landscape and how AWS has been contributing in this field. Uh, please bear in mind that this is not an in-depth view of ML concepts, and instead it is meant to be a high-level overview for those of you that have not previously been exposed to machine learning but are curious to figure out how and where to start. So I'll keep things simple for you. Let's start by taking a very brief look at the machine, at a history of machine learning. Going back to the 1950s, if you were already thinking how computers can learn and predict answers, you would be pioneer in this field, defining the machine learning concepts. Only the greatest computer scientists and mathematicians were working in this field at the time, setting the path for us to follow today. Going all the way to 2010, machine learning became widely accessible for Silicon Valley tech startups. Companies like Netflix, Google, and Facebook, they have made major advancements in this area. A great example is Netflix that offered a prize of $1 million for anyone that can improve their movie recommendation algorithm. And Facebook has famously made major advancements in their facial recognition technology. And if you wanted to get involved in this work, you would typically have a PhD level degree while working at university or perhaps for one of those tech startups, tech companies. Now moving on to today's world, companies like AWS have made machine learning accessible to much wider audience. And with modern machine learning libraries and higher level AI services, everyone has the ability to implement machine learning in their applications. And AWS has gone a long way in helping companies and individuals adopt machine learning at a scale never seen before. Whether it's the compute services with processors and graphics cards in them optimized for machine learning tasks, or services such as Amazon SageMaker, which provides a managed environment for data scientists and business analysts to implement machine learning and not worry about the undifferentiated heavy lifting so that they can move faster. And then AWS goes further by offering the higher level AI services, which can simply be consumed just like any other API endpoint, where you submit a request with, a, with some data payload and in the response, you receive a prediction and you can use many of these services without any prior AIML knowledge. A good example is Amazon Recognition Service, where you simply submit a picture via an API call, and in response, you're going to receive a whole bunch of information or metadata as to what is in this picture. It's a very cool service, and I encourage you to try it. With all that said, not all problems that you have are the right problems for machine learning today. And it's important to understand when to consider machine learning to solve your business challenge. As an example, are you facing a problem where online players take certain actions to cheat in a game? And you happen to record all these actions and you collect the data about all the actions they take. But for a human, it takes long time to pick up on these behaviors, especially given the number of, of players playing the game. Rob has earlier just called out the challenge and the amount of human power required to complete this task. And with users still complaining that it takes too long to ban the cheaters and the cheaters are still present in the game. And while cheaters behave in a certain pattern, they don't fall into a defined set of rules, making writing traditional software conditions too complex. This is a great example of a challenge that can be solved using machine learning. Next slide, please. And 
many organizations that want to utilize machine learning to solve their business problems, they struggle in understanding the path to follow when implementing machine learning solution. Having a model to put that performs a prediction, that's actually just only one piece of the puzzle, and there's a lot more to it. This is why AWS has provided our customers with a prescriptive guidance on how to implement machine learning solutions for their workloads, and it helps our customers go on this journey. Brendan and Rob will talk in more details on their progress on this journey so far, but I will just take you through this very briefly just now. At the high level, we effectively start the process by framing the business problem. And you should ask yourself the following questions. What problem is my product facing? And then would it be a good problem for machine learning? You should never ask these questions the other way around. Rob has just discussed the challenge the SMG has, which is cheating in their online games and how the players cheat. And once we have that business problem defined and that business problem framed, we need to frame this problem in machine learning context so, so that we, um, a, and I will touch on, on the common machine learning problems on the next slide so that we, we can help you with this framing. But once we have the machine problem defined, what we need to do is we need to collect the data, which then needs to be prepared, cleansed, and analyzed. Perhaps there is information in that data that is not required for this task, or data lives in a large number of very small files and needs to be consolidated for efficiencies. Then we move on to feature engineering, which is a bit of an art and important step in making our machine learning models work. Following on SMG example, perhaps there's a better way of representing the machine learning uh, uh, data, sorry, there's a better way of representing the raw data for the machine learning training. An example for, for this would be to produce a summary of how many times a player has played with another player and just how often one of the players wins. Once we, once we complete our feature engineering, we can move on to training our model and evaluating whether it achieves the desired goals that we're set to solve. If it does, we can move on to deploying the model so it can help detect the cheaters early. And if it doesn't, we need to go back and look over the data or the features we created. Can we change the structure of the data so, so that it works better for machine learning? Going back to the framing the machine learning problem from the, from the business problem, let's just, uh, it's good to have an understanding of what the common machine learning problems are. So that once the business problem is framed, we can early on understand whether it is the type of problem that could be solved using machine learning. What I've done here is I've prepared a few common examples and I'll just quickly walk through them so we all have an understanding of what they are. I think we're all familiar with ranking. We use it every day when we use the search engines. Um, it's effectively a way of giving the most relevant answer to, your, to, to what you've asked. Uh, you would have used it on Google or even when searching on, for a product on Amazon.com. Recommendation is a type of problem used by e-commerce sites such as Amazon, where you see a product or purchase location based on your browsing history or a previous purchase pattern. Classification is an interesting one. I think we've lost Sebastian for a second or two. Yes, or in true or false. Seb, you're actually Sorry, breaking up when we lost you at the classification uh, paragraph. Okay, I'll just repeat that. Um, classification is an interesting one. It's about classifying what type of is is an example of a classification. Have you lost me again? You are cutting in and out. Yes. Okay. The joys of technology. <laughs> Uh, 
Well, as Seb's cut out, I can uh, probably use his notes. Um, so if you're happy for me to continue, I can cut, uh, use Seb's notes while he sorts out his uh, technical issues. Or are you back, Seb, because you've got video. I, yeah, let's, let's see if I'm back. Uh, okay. I think I'm having some internet problems. If I cut out again, just take it, off, uh, take it over, Rob. Okay, well done. Um, yeah, where, where, we, where we left off. Uh, classification, yeah, good, good one. is an interesting one. The binary classification is an example of a classification problem where we're trying to predict a binary answer, yes or a no, true or a false. And it's actually a really relevant example for Brett and Rob because if we think about it, we are trying to predict whether a player is a cheater and the answer can be a yes or a no. Other example of a classification problem would be to trying to understand, is it going to be hot or cold tomorrow? Regression is somewhat similar, um, but it tries to achieve different outcome. Rather than predicting what kind of thing something is, it predicts the numerical value of a thing. So just following on that weather example I just gave you, instead of trying to understand what whether it will be hot or cold tomorrow, we can use regression to answer what is the temperature that's going to be tomorrow. And I want you to pay attention to those subtle differences in the question that we ask, as it defines which of these approaches are most suitable to solve our problem. Just moving on from here, Clustering, it can be used to group given data set based on its similarities. Just a simple example, we could use it to group all various fruits together into groups based on the similarities and how they look. In the SMG example, Brett and Rob are looking at how they can find out who was trying to attack some players more often than another, and clustering might potentially be a good way of doing this. Anomaly detection is a great one if you're looking at for data points within data set that stand out and they are significantly different to other data points. It can be typically used when monitoring your application running on AWS, or maybe monitoring behavior of your game. If Brett and Rob were looking to monitor for anomalies and how many players are currently playing Risk, they could easily be alerted when suddenly the number of players significantly drops, potentially indicating there's a bug or other problem with the game. Some of these examples are of supervised learning, some of these are of unsupervised learning. We won't go into a lot of the detail here, but I will cover some basics of the supervised learning in the next slide, as this is the relevant to the solution that Brett and Rob are working on. Supervised learning is where we have input data and labels that define the output. And we use machine learning algorithm to learn the mapping function from that input to the output. In the example I'm showing you, we have all various shapes that we will use for training our model. And if we, we end with each shape, we will add the label that says whether it is a triangle or it's not a triangle. We use all this data to train our machine learning model. And once the, machine, once the training is done, we have our model ready to make predictions. But how do we know that our model actually works and is effective at predicting and finding our triangles? The best way to do this is to, is to validate our model by getting it to make prediction on our test data, where we know the actual answer of whether the shape is a triangle or not. Next slide, please. And for this type of machine learning model, we can use something called confusion matrix to analyze how accurate our model is. For the test or validation data we submit, we know which of those shapes are actually triangles and which ones are not. From there, we compare these results to the results our model has predicted in order to calculate the accuracy of the predictions. Now we know how, our mo how accurate our model is at predicting the answer to our question. And based on that, we can decide whether it satisfies our expectations and whether it solves the business challenge that we have. That's it from me. I will now pass you to Brett, who will talk more about where SMG has gotten so far on their journey. Um, there is one question in the chat. Um, I... Raghav, I'll just get back to you over the chat and now let Brett carry on presenting. 
Excellent. Hi, um, I'm Brett Peacock, and I'm going to talk to you about our journey with machine learning so far. It's broken into four phases. The first phase is where we were lucky enough to work with the AWS prototyping team. They work with us to develop a machine learning prototype to detect cheats from a data set of user and game data that we provided. Then we spent some time rebuilding the prototype and trying to integrate it into our code base, which led us to taking some time, more time to really try to understand the complete machine learning process and doing some classes to help us learn more. <clears throat> After that, we broke everything down into smaller, more manageable chunks for us to rebuild our cheat detection system from the ground up. Uh, next slide, thanks. Um, we'll start uh, with the AWS prototyping team. In mid 2020, I was researching machine learning to see if it can help us detect cheats in our game. I asked our solutions architect, Seb, if he could point me in the right direction for some tutorials and resources. And he was able to do a lot better than that. We were incredibly lucky to be put in contact with the AWS prototyping team, who are, we were able to work with to create a working prototype to flag cheats in our games. During the process, um, we explained to them our problem and our current methods for detecting cheats. And we provide them with some historic user and game data, which, we, which included a large number of known cheats. AWS took this and were able to provide, provide us with a solution that processed our data into a usable format. They, gave, um, they then gave us three uh, machine learning services for detecting the fraudulent users. And finally, the results were presented through a demo admin UI. The sample data that we provided was an export from our archive database, uh, which was roughly 19 million files containing information on users and the games that they'd played. This was made up of close to 2 million users and 17 million games. All of the data was redacted to remove any potentially sensitive data, and each file was, a file was about one kilobyte each. The whole point of the data preparation phase was to get files into a suitable size and format for SageMaker to consume for machine learning. <clears throat> the optimal file size was between one and 128 megabytes. So the 19 million tiny files could take, potentially take um, uh, a few days for SageMaker to ingest instead of a few hours for more optimized data. This meant that the first steps uh, for them was to aggregate the small files into usable large joined CSV files for both the user and the game's data. And that was stored in separate uh, S3 buckets. An S3 bucket being Amazon's cloud storage resource used uh, to store files online. They utilized the sharded by S3 key feature to distribute the S3 files into mul multiple SageMaker instances that can be processed in parallel to massively reduce the processing time. Once this was done, it was time for the feature engineering step, which was where the user and game data can now be aggregated together using SQL queries in Athena. Now the data was in a state that can be used, uh, now the data was in a state that can be used to build machine learning models, which moves us onto machine learning. We were given three working solutions for building our machine learning models. The first was using Amazon's fraud detector. And this is the easiest approach to follow um, and use given that it's a fully managed service that automates the steps to build, train and deploy machine learning models. This is very appealing to us given that we were new to the game and it was gonna save us from learning more than we needed to. The second was SageMaker XG Boost. This is an open source algorithm that we can use for machine learning. It does take more of a setup and there's no UI to work with while you're developing, which can make it more difficult to use when you're starting out like us. And the third was SageMaker's Graph Convolutional Network or GCN, which is an advanced deep learning solution that I've not yet been able to understand fully yet. We also found that there were a multitude of other libraries that we could use. The cost of the three vary greatly and that you paid a significant amount more for fraud detector. And most of that cost is coming from the data preparation phase. 
All three of these solutions worked well to detect cheats in the prototype, which we were very impressed with. <clears throat> Finally, we were able to visualize the results in the admin UI that they built. It contained information on the users that the ML model had flagged as cheats. Uh, it displayed the game data and the predicted insight score, which is the level of confidence that the user is a cheat. Network graphs from our relational data source were also used to display connections between fraud fraudulent users. The thickness of the line indicating the number of games they'd played together. This sort of graph really brought home how many alt accounts some cheats were connected to. All of this information means that the admin can log in and easily see all of the information needed to confirm and ban a user. So at the end of this prototype, we're at prototype phase, we're really excited to get stuck in, try to understand what had been built and integrate it into our own system. Fast forward nine months, when we finally, finally found enough time to get back into our machine learning. I spent some time rebuilding the prototype from the templates given to uh, templates and notebooks provided to us from AWS and found it was quite daunting doing that on my own. But I was able to get it up and running. I was playing with the fraud detector service and running the model processing scripts, cleaning off the data and running it again to understand the flow when we were hit with quite a big bill. We feel like the Amazon fraud detector with the way that it charges for data preparation doesn't suit our use case and will cost too much for us to de develop and use. As said mentioned, it's a top tier service which offers an all-in-one solution and it's priced accordingly. Uh, we're a relatively small games company uh, that create games that aren't play to win. So we're constantly trying to find ways to save money. It's gonna be worth our time to investigate a more cost-effective uh, cost solutions, even if it provides us with more of a challenge. It was there that we realized that this is more, there's more to the whole process than we thought. And if we're gonna do this properly, we'd need to fully understand each step. So we thought we'd better do our homework and learn more about the complete process. Lucky enough for us, there's lots of classes on offer to help us out. We attended two Amazon immersion dates that were invaluable to our understanding of the complete machine learning process. The data engineering day taught us about how we should be getting our data out, how we should be getting data out of our app and into a data lake. Our data lake being an S3 bucket that contains all of the raw game and user data that we think is useful for machine learning. This is also where we learned a lot about how to process the data from the lake into a more usable format using Glue ETL jobs and Glue crawlers. A Glue ETL job, ETL standing for extract, transform and load, is a way of processing uh, the data from its original source. You extract the data from the source location, transform it by doing something as simple as removing a field that you don't need and loading the results into the target location. These will be used multiple times in our data journey from raw data to finished product. Glue crawlers are then used to crawl the output data uh, to detect a common schema. The crawler will then write a table to your data catalog. And this means our data will be in a format ready to be queried by Athena. Athena is a serverless query service that allows you to query data directly from S3 buckets um, using standard SQL. Since we've made sure uh, that the process data has a consistent format through our glue job, the scheme has been found and saved through the crawler, then we can now query the data through SQL, which blew me away when I first saw it in action. The immersion day from Sa for SageMaker then took off where the data engineering day ended. SageMaker is a product that helps prepare, build, train and deploy machine learning models. We learned how to set up SageMaker notebook instances which you can use to write and run the code for each step of the building, training and deployment of your model. We're finally able to deploy an XG Boost model and spend some time learning how to monitor and debug this model. After this day, we realized that the machine learning side of things is a beast in itself. And we've not yet even dived into this process very far yet. So now I've got a better understanding of how to manage our data and use SageMaker for the model deployment, it was time to implement these learnings. 
We went back and we looked at the whole machine learning process that Seb spoke about, and we broke it into smaller steps. First of all, we focused on the data preparation phase, which we thought we were better prepared to handle. To make the most of what we'd learnt, we instead tackled a smaller project. We thought that being able to process and visualise our data would be a good first step and it would be more of an achievable task. Processing and visualising the user and game data was going to be a complicated first step. So instead, we decided that we would use data from, uh, from our users making in-game purchases, as we thought this would be easier. And this would also give us great insight into what people were buying and when. If we can get this into a service like QuickSight to visualize it, then our project managers will be able to create their own graphs and extract data however they want. Once this smaller project was complete, we could use the same pipeline that we created for our cheat data. The data collection step was relative, relatively simple using the AWS SDK in our code. We could use that to send our raw purchase data through a Kinesis Firehose into an S3 bucket. We were able to set the infrastructure up with a straightforward cloud formation script, which was an easy win. So we're off to a good start. We did spend a little bit of time making sure to batch up our data before we sent it through Firehose. And this is gonna be an ongoing process to make sure we get the sizes right and to optimize our costs. The next step was to take the raw purchase data from S3 and do an initial clean. And then that is to strip out any information not useful and to convert some data types. This was our first glue ETL job and it, as represented in the left, left column. We also created a crawler that exposes the schema data that can later be used to query through Athena. <clears throat> Remembering that Athena is not actually a database, but a serverless query service. So it can retrieve data from any other any data source, in our, in our case, S3, using standard SQL syntax. This got our purchase data cleaned and stored in S3 and queryable through Athena. After that, we need to make the data more human readable. For example, converting numerical IDs into product names. To do this, we need to get a map of the IDs to names or state data into S3. I'll show this in the middle column of the slide. Um, uh, we put our state data into S3 by using a glue job to directly query our main RDS database and put the clean data into S3. This is then joined in a later process. There are alternate ways um, of getting the state data. If it changes frequently, you'll need, uh, or you need time sensitive states, you could run a similar process to the event data, having it pushed from the server when anything changes. And this will store the data in S3 for a later join as well. Or you can use what's known as federated queries, which is where you run a join while processing the raw data all in one step. And you get the state data directly from the source RDS each time. Although we did find this to be a bit slow and fiddly with an unknown resource hit on our main database. Now we have the three buckets of data, one for the purchases and two for the lookup tables, which need to be joined up. Uh, this is shown on the diagram on the right. Using a join query in Athena, we were able to save the results into another S3 bucket in the format that we can use for our visualizations. As you can see, the whole data processing pipeline is just a series of ETL processes chained together. If we ever go wrong, we can just go back to the raw data and start again. Of course, there's plenty of learnings along the way to do this seemingly simple task. Uh, finally, we need to make sure that we didn't run the same process uh, through an ETL uh, multiple times, or we'll get duplicates down the line. Blue has the option to use what's known as bookmarks. And bookmarks are used to prevent a job from reprocessing data. But these won't work when I run an Athena query to join and export the data. So I'm going to need a way of querying only new data that's been added since the last join uh, query ran. To get around this, we went back to the first step, the initial purchase data glue job, and we updated it so that we can attach a timestamp to the data being processed. And that timestamp can then be used uh, in our query to make sure we only get the newest data since the last export. Um, now that our data is clean, we can import it into QuickSight for visualization. 
QuickSight allows us to easily create graphs and reports to help us better understand that data. The import is a matter of just, just a matter of selecting an S3 bucket that you want to use. And once the data is in, it's incredibly simple to start setting up dashboards and visualizing the data. It's great to give a producer access to QuickSight as they can create their own graphs and extract data as they want. Having practiced on purchase data, we need to return to our goal of using the cheat data. Um, making the process, the data processor processing run for cheat data instead of purchase data should be a relatively simple task. If we put what we've done into cloud formation, then it's easy to rebuild a new pipeline for any data type that we want. Through our time using AWS services, we've embraced the power of cloud formation to automate our processes. This helps us to reduce errors when rebuilding and also documents our work. It means I can also share the information on what I've created with the rest of my team, which in my case is just Robbie. It helps to strengthen our knowledge of the ETL scripts and highlight some holes that we hadn't found out while building everything manually. We did have some hurdles along the way, such as grappling with IAM roles for permissions to all of the required resources. We found that you can't just run an Athena query on a schedule. So instead we ran it through a glue job, which does enable scheduling. And there are other, there are other ways to do this, like using Lambda, but we found this to be easiest. It also took us a while to correct, uh, to work out the correct cloud formation settings for connecting our RDS database through glue and extracting and attaching that to the, um, to the glue job. I found the documentation, documentation for cloud formation was great, but it would be really handy to have more use case examples in the, either in the documentations or in blogs or on sites like Stack Overflow. So this is where we're at with the build so far. Our next steps are to go back to our cheat detector uh, detection and continue working with uh, our, the ML model. We need to integrate this into our game, game backend system as we want this to run seamlessly in the background, constantly detecting cheats. Once we have something running, then we'll work on improving it as we're sure that there's no one size fits all option or model for catching cheats. People will try to cheat in different ways so we'll probably need to deploy multiple approaches for catching them, as Robbie discussed, such as user behavior analysis or user opponent analysis. For example, we could use graph network to detect connections between fraudulent users or using clustering to detect anomalous behaviors that are outside the norms. Uh, from all of this, um, we'll hopefully learn more about the data that we're providing to the models and what fields are needed. Will we need to include more data uh, than we're already providing? And if so, what data will that be? We'll also start factoring in more information on the general interactions with the app, such as how one user might navigate the UI differently to other users. So in summary, while we haven't actually touched the ML side of things in our system, we now have a much better understanding of what's going on in the prototype that AWS provided us. We've cut through some of the jargon. We know what SageMaker is and how to use notebooks. We aren't totally confused when we hear the words clustering, Bayes, GCN, or principal component analysis. We have data to play with and we can easily get more. There's a lot to learn by the whole machine learning process, but it can be broken, it's bro it can be broken in different parts with a different job role for each. And while it is a big task, the goals are fairly clear along the way. Our suggestion is to follow the machine learning process diagram uh, so that you can break your work down into manageable chunks and then that can be validated at each phase. While you can do this on your own, having a team behind you is invaluable. Take advantage of free courses out there. Sign yourself for, up for AWS Immersion Day or find a class in the Machine Learning University. Don't expect things to happen too quickly. There's lots of moving parts that require your attention. And finally, getting machine working learning on your system is an achievable task. Even though we haven't got a working version yet, we can see the light at the end of the tunnel and we're confident we'll be more efficient at catching cheats on our games in the near future. Thank you. Awesome, thank you. I, let's tackle the questions just now. One favor I've got to ask of everyone um, that's on the call and 
that would be to spend literally 30 seconds to fill out the feedback form to let us know how we did. Just two questions in there, one to five, just your score of how you felt about the session. You can scan the QR code with your mobile phone or just follow the feedback link I just posted. We would hugely appreciate that as it just allows us to understand whether we enjoyed the session and uh, or whether we need to improve. Um, so yeah, if everyone could do that, that would be awesome. Uh, we do have, moving back on to questions, uh, we've got one question in the chat from Lokesh. I will, I will read it out. The number of cheaters or examples of cheat data in training could be way small than the normal players. How did you deal with skewed data set in your ML problem? Uh, Brett and Rob, I just want to check first if um, I can answer if that you... one. Awesome. Yes. Um, firstly, the number of cheaters are smaller than the number of uh, players, but there is a huge uh, data set to play with. Uh, there are an awful lot of cheaters that we managed to uh, find and trap. Our biggest worry was not actually whether we had a skewed data set, um, it was whether we had an accurate data set to start with. We used the labeling approach, so we already had labeled our cheaters that we knew. We put that into the model, and the model was derived by AWS to determine whether or not we, um, we could uh, find the cheaters. We then wanted to add an, another batch of che uh, cheaters labeled to test the theory to find out whether or not it was accurate. And from there, we would start need, need to refine the model over and over again to adapt for those cheaters that we hadn't previously caught and hadn't previously labeled. So our problem was not so much a skewed data set, but uh, the we need to uh, modify and improve the, the, the data that we were feeding in to make sure our labels were correct of our source data. And I go back to the feedback loop that Sebastian was talking about, about when, when you find your data is going a little bit off, you can change your model and keep tweaking. It's a circular process. Does that answer your question? I will take a silence as a yes, unless anything else comes up in, comes up in chat or location comes off mute. Yep, thank you. Okay, cool. We have next question. What kind of services AWS Teams support? Is it free or paid services? I can potentially take this one. Um, just want to make sure I understand what you mean by what kind of services AWS Teams support. Um, on our side, we're obviously helping SMG from, through all of the AWS services available, and whether that's myself or the specialists available at AWS. But uh, Rob and Brett are making most use of the um, services which are S3, which is effectively a way of storing large number of blob data very cheaply. Um, Kinesis, which is a way of delivering the data from their system in high volume to the S3. Um, Glue, which is effectively a extract, transform, a load process to make changes to the data set and Athena to query this data using SQL-like statements to make it really easy to explore the data. From there on, we've got the Amazon SageMaker, which allows you to effectively load the data in, grab, your, uh, grab the algorithm, grab the model, run the trainings, run the predictions, and then even do the inference uh, on SageMaker. And the alternative that, that, um, uh, that Brett talked about is the Amazon Fraud Detector, which is that managed AI service where, you, where it's actually super easy to use. You just give it data, that's the training, tells you how good it is, and then you just get an API endpoint that you get to use to, to perform predictions. Uh, that's a high level of the services. They all have free tier. So all of these services you can actually try for free, and the free tier can be generous with a lot of these services. The moment you start using in production or you've got large data sets, then when you, that's when you start incurring charges. It's pay as you go model for all of these and the pricing is all on the AWS websites. Might add there as well, whenever we did our, um, uh, our uh, immersion days as well, you get given um, Amazon credit too. So everything that you do during, during that, you have an, actually have an account. They give you an account that you can use uh, for the day or for, for 48 hours and uh, and all of that is free while you're while you're playing around with the services. Awesome. Any other questions from anyone? Feel free to come off mute. Someone has raised their hand. 
Uh, it's from Lokesh. Lokesh, do you want to come off mute to ask the question? Uh, give me a second. Let me uh, unmute you. Uh... Uh, hello. Uh, are you able to hear me? Yes. Uh, yes okay. go ahead. Uh, thanks for the wonderful talk. It was very useful and informative. I have a quick question um, on the on the on how you use the ML algorithm. Uh, when Brett was presenting, I noticed that the algorithm is working real time in detecting the cheaters. So, um, in any algorithm, that could be like false alarm. So, uh, how frequently did you hit this false alarm, and how did you deal with it? Thank you. Um, we, I'm not sure about that. Um, we we weren't running it in real time. Uh, we were always running it on. First of all, always running it on. Um, originally, the prototype we ran it off uh, some old archive data, um, and we can't see ourselves running it in real time right now. Anyway, um, and then with false alarm. Are you talking about false uh, false positives or or well, false negatives. Okay. Oh, okay. Robbie, do you oh. have anything to add? Yes, otherwise. Oh, well, hey, false positives. Yeah, the, 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 okay. yeah, the, the goal of our original um, uh, uh, stab was to actually give the UI and the feedback to the customer service team. If we could add that to the bank of their knowledge. Uh, the, eventually, we would make try and make this uh, fully automated, maybe not real time. Uh, it, again, depends on the process and the flow we go through. Uh, but uh, yes, there will be false positives, but there will be less false positives than we currently have. As I said, we do have an awful lot of smarts already in the system. Uh, they are far from perfect, however, which is why we're looking at machine learning to actually improve what we do. So no matter what solution we end up with, it is going to be better than we, we currently do. Uh, to get around that, we actually have a suspension system in game. So we suspend users first with the warning. Well, we give them a warning followed by a suspension, followed by escalations uh, before we actually completely ban users. The more serious users, get our customer support team has to actually ban them directly. Uh, if we got more accurate data, we'd be able to skip some of that or make the suspensions immediately a lot stronger. So hopefully that answers the question. You're welcome. Looks like it. Are, are there any other questions? Yeah, all good. Um, if there's no question, I think uh, we can end there for um, today's uh, session. So I um, 